In this video, I'll talk about hypothetical syllogisms, what they're used for, their validity. Also, I'll talk a little bit about enthymemes and the transitive property. Hello, I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher Show, Introduction to Propositional Logic Course. Now, remember we're looking at notable argument forms. And last time I talked about modus ponens, modus tollens, denying the antecedent, affirming the consequent. And one thing that we saw that was interesting is that when we talk about argument forms, an argument that shares a valid argument form is going to be necessarily valid. However, an argument that is an instance of an invalid argument form is not necessarily going to be invalid. It might also be an instance of a valid argument form. So we're looking today at hypothetical syllogism and seeing, is this a valid argument form? Is it an invalid argument form? If it's valid, then any argument that we make that using this form, right, uh, making an instance of this form will also be valid. So it'll be very useful. As an example of this argument form, first let's take kind of a wacky argument found in Monty Python, Holy Grail. Sir Bedivere gives this in the witch scene. And I've had to tweak it a little bit here. So you'll notice some of the, the conditionals are probably not the way that he does it. Um, and, and I'll explain that in a second. So the argument goes something like this. If something is a witch, then that thing burns. If a thing burns, then it's made of wood. If it's made of wood, then it floats. If it floats, then it's a duck. If it's a duck, then it weighs as much as a duck. Therefore, if a thing is a witch, then it weighs as much as a duck. Now, I, I said that I changed a few of these. Uh, premise two and premise four are not really the way that Sir Bedivere gives them in the movie, they're actually swapped around. And because of that, it sounds slightly more plausible. I mean, it's clearly a ridiculous argument. Um, but if we were to, to symbolize it out with those, the way he said it, it would be clearly logically fallacious. So instead I traded it for clearly false propositions. In any case, here's our argument that we're gonna look at. We're gonna pretend like Sir Bedivere gave this argument this way. And our question is, is this a valid argument? So let's symbolize it first. Uh, we'll have W stand for a thing is a witch, B for it burns, uh, O for it's made out of wood, because obviously the, there are two W's here, F for it floats, D for it's a duck, and maybe P for it weighs as much as a duck, you know, P for pounds. Um, I apologize to you metric people with your kilograms and whatnots. Now, we could do a truth table for this argument, except for it would be long and tedious. And when I look at this argument anyway, I see that it kind of intuitively looks like it should work, right? It looks like it should be valid. If you see like the, the antecedent for each premise is actually the consequent for the one before it. And the only different ones are the antecedent for the first premise, obviously, because nothing came before it. And then the consequent for the last premise, but those are the ones that, that are connected together in the conclusion. And it looks like that should work, right? This is what's called a transitive relation. If this, if this is a transitive relation, if that does work, it's a transitive relation. And a transitive relation is one in which if one thing is related in this particular way to a second thing, that second thing is related in this particular way to a third thing, that means the first thing is related to the third thing in that particular way. So. For example, the equals in uh, math. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Now, the equal sign also has other relations, but one of the relations in equals is the transitive relation. Also, the ancestor relation. So if my father is my ancestor and I am my son's ancestor, then my father is my son's ancestor. And, and you see how it's sort of like it, it passes itself along. However, uh, not all relations are, are transitive. So, for example, if I wanted to say I am a parent of, my father is a parent of me, I am a parent of my son. However, my father is not a parent of my son. So not all relations are transitive relations. And it, it like I said, intuitively, it seems like this should be a transitive relation, this conditional. Uh, however, we can't cheat, right? We can't just say, yeah, it looks like it looks like that's right. And, and besides, I think we're kind of skewed here by that arrow looking thing. You know, the arrow makes it look like, yeah, we're going in this direction, you know, and to the left of is a transitive relation. If W is to the left of B and B is to the left of O, then W is to the left of O. And that, that arrow makes it look like that's the case. It looks like they're related in that you know, left to right kind of a way. So 
we don't want to cheat here and uh, just assume that this is a transitive relation. And yet, I also don't want to do a truth table for this heinous argument. I also don't want to do a truth table for every single conditional setup like this because that wouldn't prove that the next one was going to be valid. What I want to do is see if the argument form is a valid argument form. And in fact, I don't even need to see if this entire argument form, the, the way it is exactly right here, is a valid argument form. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, sort of truncate this argument. I'm going to look at uh, an argument form for an argument that's a little bit smaller. If alpha, then beta. If beta, then gamma. Therefore, if alpha, then gamma. And notice, using this setup, if this works, then I can get the former argument. And the reason is because the conclusion here I can use in uh, a second argument. So for example, if I prove that this is a valid argument, then the argument, if W then B, if B then O, therefore if W then O, I can prove that that's a valid argument. And I could take that conclusion if W then O, and I can combine that with if O then F, Therefore, if W then F, and I can take that conclusion, and you know, all those things will be just strings of this argument form right here. So all I need to do really is to show that this argument form is a valid argument. So let's look at the truth table and see if it is. Remember that the first step we have is to just distribute out all the T's and F's, just like the key here says. And then uh, it's time to evaluate these three different conditionals. But actually, before we do, Remember that a conditional is only false if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And looking at the conclusion here, the bottom four rows there, rows five through eight, the antecedent is false, so that's gonna be a true conditional. So actually, those bottom four, I know that my, con my conclusion is true, and if my conclusion is true, then I'm not gonna have to worry about anything because remember, an argument is only invalid if it has at least one row where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Well, in those bottom four rows, the conclusion isn't false. So I don't have to check anything else. I can skip that work and I, I'm telling you, what's gonna make you a better mathematician or logician is laziness, <laughs> is looking at this thing and say, before I have to do work, you know, before you start plugging away and start, you know, calculating and stuff like that, we don't need you to be calculator. We have calculators, we need you to be a thinker. So before you start calculating, look at it and think, what do I really have to do here? What's the easiest way? Are there any shortcuts I have here that will help me out? So I know that I don't have to check the bottom four. I might have to check the top four. Look at that again in the uh, only places where the conclusion is false, it looks like, is rows two and four. In rows two and four, we have a true antecedent, false conclusion. So I actually don't have to check rows one and three. Those In those, the conclusion is true as well. So let's look at those two rows. In row two, I see that the second premise there has a true antecedent false conclusion. That means that that premise right there is, it's a false conditional, so the premise is false. So that means that I don't have all true premises and a false conclusion. Good, that can't make this an invalid argument. Check the fourth row. It looks like the first conditional there, the first premise has a true antecedent and a false conclusion. So that's a false premise. And it looks like I never have it be the case that my premises are true and my conclusion is false. There are no rows like that. So this is a valid argument form. So now that we have done the hard work and have figured out that this argument form is valid, and I told you how we could build, we can construct Bedivere's argument using this argument form, let's cheat a little bit and look at it intuitively one more time. This one isn't quite as, uh, as much of a cheat, but but imagine what would happen if we just assume W were true. Like just pretend W is true. And this move that I'm about to pull is actually one that you can pull in some some logic setups. Uh, it's it's a move that that is valid or or some some logicians build into their systems. So pretend like W is true. Provisionally assume W is true. What would happen if W then B? W therefore B, right? That's what my uh, that's what my modus ponens argument form showed me in the last video. And now that I have B, notice that I'll have if B then O, B therefore O. So, you know, I'll get O. And I'll just keep going down the line, and at the very end there, I'll get P, right? That will be my last thing. So in other words, if I assume that W, 
then I will get the conclusion that P. But now, I don't know if W is true or not. Notice this argument never makes the claim that W is true. But if W is true, I just showed, you know, kind of intuitively here that P would also be true. So the conclusion, if W, then P, seems like it follows intuitively. By the way, you may have noticed that if we continue this argument, then they make an additional logical fallacy when uh, it says if W then P, if she's a witch, then she weighs as much as a duck. They weigh the girl. She does weigh as much as a duck. They conclude, therefore, she is a witch. However, that doesn't follow. Remember, that is affirming the consequent, which again, we saw in the last video, is an invalid argument form. So another logical fallacy in this slew of fallacies, or I should say that the original form that they give is a slew of fallacies. The way I've set it up here, notice, is, is actually a valid argument form. The way they had it before, and we don't really need to look at it, but the way they had it before was full of, of little fallacies like, like this final one. So now we've learned something kind of useful here. You know, if we have a string of conditionals and for each conditional, the antecedent of that conditional is the consequent of the one before it, except for the first and the last one, obviously, then we can take that first antecedent and that last consequent and put it into a conditional and we can save ourselves a lot of room, a lot of space. Awesome. And it, it doesn't sound like it would be, you know, like, what, are we just trying to save paper? No, that's not necessarily the problem. The problem is more like when we're presenting arguments, we don't want to say every single premise here. So typically you're going to say something like this where you skip over a lot of the steps in the middle. And that's called an enthymeme when you sort of just uh, don't say every single premise that you have. And it's very useful when you're doing hypothetical syllogisms because as we see, it, it's a valid argument form. The warning I would give, though, is oftentimes when enthymemes like this, especially, you know, enthymemes of hypothetical syllogisms, um, the unstated premises a lot of times can be fallacious ones. One example that I can think of is when my kids argue about these uh, rainbow pops, my neighbor has them. My wife always gets the, you know, made with pure fruit ones that taste like crap, but my kids love the, you know, the sugar-filled high fructose corn syrup ones with the terrible jokes on them that you tell as a kid. Even though you don't get them, you'd realize that they should be funny. So you tell them and everybody laughs. Ha ha ha, nobody understands what it is. Um, except for the adults who realize that it's not funny. So I hear my son saying to the other son, if you try to get this, this popsicle from me, you are going to cry. Why? Because if you try to get this popsicle from me, I'm gonna lick it. And, you know, if you don't get what you want, then you cry. So if you try to get this popsicle from me, you're going to cry. Now, notice that argument. We can, we can even symbolize it out a little bit here. So if, let's say, T, you try to get what you, my popsicle, then L, I'm going to lick my popsicle. And then if D, you don't get what you want, then C, you are going to cry. Therefore, if T, then C. Now, notice this looks like the beginnings of a hypothetical syllogism, except for obviously it's, it's missing some premises in here. We, we need to have a string of conditionals where every antecedent is, you know, the consequent of the prior conditional. So let's see if we can figure out what the unstated premises are here. It looks like the, the, that first conditional ends with an L. I'm going to lick the popsicle. So that will be the antecedent for our next one. If I lick the popsicle, then you would be grossed out enough not to take it. So let's say G. And if you're grossed out enough not to take it, then you won't get what you want. So if G, then D. And then we have, you know, our uh, string here. It looks like that this is the hypothetical syllogism that we were coveting there. But notice in those... Uh, in those unstated premises, one of them is if I lick it, then you'll be grossed out enough that you you know you won't be able to take it. Um, that is an assumption that possibly so, and I've seen before. Unfortunately, some of my children are very willing to reject. <laughs> they are very willing. Oh, you licked it? I don't care. Give it to me anyway. Um, so, one of the unstated premises here is the one that we could really reject. And yet when we don't say it, it's sort of like hidden in there. So we're not really sure uh, why this argument doesn't work 
if we don't figure out what those premises are. So yeah, the hypothetical syllogism, it's great to sort of uh, squash it down like an accordion where we just have one conditional. Um, the problem is when we do so and, and we enthymeme it in this way, we're, we could be assuming a, a premise that is not a good premise. It's a false premise, possibly. It's, it could be just a disputable premise. So we want to be careful when we're putting these hypothetical syllogisms together that we are not leaving out premises that could be questionable. Okay, that's the hypothetical syllogism. It's a useful tool for condensing strings of conditionals, as we've seen. It is a valid argument form. That means any argument you make using this form will be valid. It shows that the conditional is a transitive relation and also used sometimes in endomemes, in which case we need to be kind of cautious about what we're leaving out. In the next video, we'll talk about the constructive dilemma, and that's gonna be pretty fun. I've got uh, an ethical dilemma for you that uh, some of you guys, if you're philosophers, you've seen it a ton, the uh, trolley problem. But it's pretty fun for those of you who haven't, and even for those of you who have, just to revisit it and see what you think this time. In any case, I'll see you in that video. Adios.